Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the Core Trust Your Training uh, 2022. Uh, I'm Hervé Lors. I'm from the uh, Core Trust Your Repository, the UK Data Archive, uh, based at the University of Essex. <clears throat> I think the most important thing to uh, make clear, first of all, is that today I am just the hopefully friendly face of the Core Trust Seal as I lead you through this work. But everything that you see today has been prepared by others and all the materials that you'll uh, that you'll see and be linked to for later has all been prepared by kind of a wide range of other kind of volunteers and and board members. So thanks very much to them. Um, I won't be able to see a great deal of what's going on while I'm speaking. So um, Lisa will uh, will jump in if there are any other questions or anything, but just to, just to get started. Um, a couple of items of housekeeping to kick off. Uh, do please keep your microphones muted and the camera off during the presentations. If you've got any questions, then feel free to share them in the chat, raise your hand, um, and then you'll be asked to speak. Lisa will take control of that as well. Um, do be aware, as Lisa said, that this session is being recorded and will be published in parts. And feel free to use at Core Trust Seal on on Twitter or on your preferred social media if you want to do that as well. Uh, and obviously for the usual privacy reasons, uh, let's not take any screenshots of participants without asking for, for permission as we go along and publishing those. Um, we've got a, uh, a simple but fairly packed agenda today. <clears throat> um, I'll sort of take you through an opening and a gentle, in, gentle and general introduction to the Core Trust Seal work and where we stand. Uh, there'll be a couple of breakout sessions. Um, these will be both on the technical requirements, 14, 15 and 16, and on uh, the legal and ethical requirements and the preservation plan. Uh, those will be 20 minute sessions each. Yeah. And everybody gets to join a session and then and then swap out to the other session afterwards, uh, followed by a Q&A, followed by some closing remarks. Um, so there have been a variety of people uh, involved behind the scenes, and some of them will be uh, participating today. Uh, we've got uh, Lisa Deleu, who you've, you'll have seen already, uh, Pascal Flor, Rena Jenkins, who'll be taking over my duties, but obviously doing a better job this afternoon. Uh, Mary Klimola will join us uh, via video. <clears throat> I've already introduced myself, I've already lost. Uh, we'll also hear from Olivier Rouchon and Michael Berber during the course of the day. Um, if you'd like to pop an introduction to yourself into the chat that says which repository you're from and where in the world you're based, that'd be lovely. Um, we've got limited time. Um, there will be other opportunities for a bit more, a uh, bit more coffee morning style interaction, uh, but we'll crack on today. Um, one of the main reasons behind this is that the uh, periodic review of the Core Trust Seal has now taken place. Um, this is open to the usual process. It's kind of completely public. Uh, the huge amount of feedback is received, um, collated, and within the goals of remaining, you know, at the core of Core Trust Seal, which is always one of the challenges. Uh, the idea is to make sure that the Core Trust Seal remains uh, current and relevant and meaningful. Um, so the diagram that you see before you is uh, the variation between Core Trust Seal 2020 to 2022 and the current one, which will run from January next year until 2025. Um, there are probably look like there are more changes than there actually are there. There have been some naming changes for clarity. Uh, storage issues have been moved to technology and security, as that's primarily how these are addressed by the applicants when they come in. Uh, obviously, the numbering has been impacted. Uh, by these changes, but we would expect that the level of information, detail and evidence expected will be broadly similar for the new version of requirements. So there'll be some adjustments, but there is sort of basic stability what's with, with what's happening here. Um, so you'll get to look at the video recordings, which we'll link to later for a more complete review of all those different changes. So behind this training approach at the moment is all supported by a video series, which is will be available on YouTube. These are still going up at the moment, but they're all in progress. Um, these will cover general best practices. There'll be one video per requirement to describe it. Um, the evidence expectations, um, examples, submission statements <clears throat> and highlights to changes. So that we have a whole YouTube playlist on that. Um, 
So a pre-training so session survey was conducted to identify the comfort levels of reviewers for each requirement. These vary, as you know, I'm sure you've experienced enormously. Uh, so in terms of the training, all the reviewers are expected to attend one of the training sessions today or watch the video recordings that are to be made available. Uh, and out at some point after this, there'll be a short quiz to help verify everyone's comprehension of the updated requirements. Uh, all fairly kind of informal at this stage, but just kind of trying to increase the level of support we provide to, to new reviewers. Um, we had 41 respondents to the uh, survey results. And as you can see, there's a, there's a pretty wide spectrum of experience. Um, so there'll be somebody with roughly your experience level somewhere out there on the call today. Um, so, and we looked at the requirements with the lowest comfort levels. Um, and these will be the focus of the, the breakout sessions. And you can see here that we've got a variation specifically on these ones, so legal and ethical or security. We've got a higher overall comfort level, but uh, legal and ethical, um, maybe sort of a more of a variation there as well. Um, so this is all about review experience as well over time. So there's, there's a balance. Some of these things will get easier as you perform more reviews. Some of them will remain challenging just because we're dealing at a fairly generalist level with a wide variety of different repositories with different missions and different circumstances. Um, and we all start off thinking that probably most repositories are like our own. We're all fairly similar in some very important ways, but we're all special and different in important ways as well. <clears throat> now, Lisa, you'll have to tell me if anybody jumps in with any sort of horrendous um, sort of uh, additional questions in here, but we did want to sort of try and answer a few of the, the key questions that came up in the surveys just briefly so that people have got some additional context. Um, to the level of collaboration and agreement that's expected between the two reviewers, well, the reviewers do work independently. <clears throat> but contact between reviewers can be arranged, and we especially try and do that if it's the if it's the first review. So you can always contact the info at address and make sure that you're getting the level of support and, and collaboration that's agreed. Um, now there are inevitably inconsistencies among reviewers, and we've been asked about how the disagreements are handled. Um, I think one of the things to mention here is that reviewers don't need to agree fully with each other. This is the whole point of a of a peer review process. Um, you know, we've got a double a double peer review and the applicants are expected to respond to all the comments and concerns that are raised. Now, in addition to this, the board does evaluate the reviewer comments and they may add board comments to the applicant where needed. So something might happen in addition to what the to what the applicants have said. Um, though Despite the fact that we do accept that there will be disagreement, part of this training work is seeking to make these reviews more consistent over time. Um, and that training is influenced by some of the variants that we see in the different reviews. Um, one of the challenges there, of course, is the fact that, as I said before, you will have a, a wide variety of applicants and a wide variety of scenarios. And this is also connected to the next question, which is what is the expected time commitment for reviewers? So when you sit down for your first review, do you make sure you allocate a full day to doing this, to give yourself uh, an opportunity to run through everything, just to get an overall sense of what's there, and then to work through it in more detail. Other than that, <clears throat> Your commitment is going to be, I think, three reviews per year is the is the is the goal for being a member of the assembly of the reviewers. Individually, the length of time for each review is something we are trying to capture in more detail, but it can be very hard to estimate, depending on how many rounds there are for each review, kind of up to five, and the amount of information provided in evidence statements, which might vary based on the the age or size of the repository, and the amount of supporting evidence as well. It will also be dependent on the experience of the reviewer. These things will, in many ways, get easier over time, um, but there will always be a point um, where you face challenges. And that's just the situation. Um, we did have a question about what happens when there's a difference between a level of compliance and the quality of the answer, which we kind of tried to interpret this question as best we could. So there's a bit of a tricky issue here. Um, 
even with really clear evidence of compliance, either in the evidence statement or in the supporting evidence, sometimes you'll see a response that's badly written or even badly spelled, something that's been rushed through in one way or another. Now, this is important because the final assessments are public and this can reflect on the applicant. Yeah? Um, but this needs to be balanced with the fact that the review isn't there to rewrite the review for the applicant. Uh, but we can, in our overall comments, suggest a, a general review for clarity or, or, or spelling or language or, or something like that. So that's feedback that we can give. Um, but primarily, the reviewer role is to look at the, uh, the evidence and the evidence statements presented and respond directly to those. Um, <clears throat> so Alternatively, if the response is, seems clear, but the evidence contains broken links or, or can't be provided, then that needs to be included in your comments. Yeah? So this is this is a this is a balance, and that that difference in quality is another factor that that impacts time. Uh, was there anything that I needed to uh, respond to there in the chat, Lisa? Before I carry on. No, nope, no questions yet. Excellent. Thank you very much. I just wanted to double check on that one. Yeah. So something that has been <clears throat> um, something that has been introduced and something that we're working to to improve over time is is, is more of a triage process at the beginning of a review, um, whether or not somebody is in scope or whether or not there's enough supporting evidence across the materials. Uh, if you just start at the beginning and move to the end, can, can take a little while to work out. Um, now, might maybe because applicants have, have put their evidence in a slightly unusual place or there's a, a degree of repetition or a lack of clarity. But what we are suggesting is that the whole process starts with a triage. And this is something that we'd urge you to kind of get to as soon as possible after a, a, a review is assigned to you so that we can make that triage decision and get it back to the applicant if necessary. <clears throat> so. Starting off with, is the definition of the designated community, the people who are going to be served, clear enough? Um, so they need to understand the scope, the knowledge base, the methodologies of those users, and who the curation and preservation measures are really aimed at. Um, once you know who that group is, then you can look at, say, <clears throat> R9 for preservation plan to assure that there is active preservation <clears throat> excuse me, taking place. Um, because those active preservation measures need to be ongoing. Um, so deposit and appraisal then is another area to check that this whole workflow is working end to end to deliver a long term view to kind of the access, reusability and understandably understandability of the digital objects. And then wander into look at reuse and make sure that that designated community and those preservation actions um, ensure that there is appropriate information available to support understanding and use of the digital objects over time. <clears throat> in many places, this will be clear, the applicant will be clearly in scope and everything will be fine. But if it's not clear, then we don't need to necessarily run through every other detail of the application. Um, if it's not clear that they offer active preservation, what the levels of curation are, or that the, whatever, that the community is well served, then either they're not in scope or they don't have the information. And in that case, we can make those comments immediately and return them to the applicant so that they can make revisions to the appropriate items. Uh, and we're hoping that that will speed up the process both for reviewers and for the applicants themselves, because uh, good, fast feedback is always appreciated, as I'm sure you'll know as, as applicants as well. Now we'll jump Definitely, over. There was one question from the audience. I can manage that. Go on. Good. Uh, the question is, can we involve technical colleagues for advice if we take care to protect the identity of the applicants? I would say that there is always going to be a, uh, a level of internal conversation about the requirements quite broadly. Um, but you are the reviewer. Yeah. So you will always be learning more. There will always be areas that we know less about. So yes, I have asked my colleagues and said, well, what do you think of, of this general issue in relation to a, into a requirement? Um, so I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, I think you can also ask those questions to info at as well. 
but I think the the questioner has has nailed the important point, which is that the important thing is to is to maintain the confidentiality of the applicant. But yes, this will be always be a review. It will always be a learning process for everyone concerned. Um, so it is perfectly acceptable to keep on keep on learning as you go through these. Thank you. And I think with that, Liz, it's it's over to you for a quick look at the new online tool. Yeah, um, this is not a very clear slide, but it is a sneak preview. <laughs> Basically, what I've been doing is I've been building a new tool for you guys to be able to do the reviews a little bit, uh, um, not better, but easier. Um, I basically made a screen that shows you what the requirements are on the right hand side and in the middle you have the applicant's response um, for the background information which I'm showing now there are not uh, any separate links that can be shown but when you're in the requirements themselves uh, the applicants can actually put links there and reuse them even uh, to show, uh, for instance, their preservation plan or any information that they have on their websites or what, whatever they need to point you to. So they'll have a text, which is the evidence, and there'll be links under there. Then on the left-hand side, you'll have different tabs. One of the tabs will be the guidance. So when you're an applicant filling in your, <clears throat> your evidence, you can read what the evidence is on the side kind of thing. But also when the reviewer has given comments back, that's another tab you can open so you can have your own evidence open, but also see the comments that the reviewer made on the left hand side. So hopefully this will give you a more um, overall picture of what's going on and you don't have to have different screens open and stuff like that. Um, I will be making a training video once this tool is ready because we're still, you know, working on the finishing touches. Uh, so once that's ready, it will be online and I will make sure that it's on our YouTube channel as well and put it in the newsletter as soon as it's available. Uh, for the reviewers, it will work exactly the same. You can see the evidence of the applicants and then put in your own reviewer comments kind of thing. But this will all be explained in the video a little bit later on in the year. That was it. Yeah. And on the right hand side you can see all the requirements and also the background information and once um, an application has gone through a round you can also see which uh, um, requirements have been changed by the applicants so as a reviewer you don't have to go through everything you can just have a look at the requirements that were changed that was it Thank you very much, Lisanne. <clears throat> um, I think we're all probably looking forward to having like a, a little bit more of a, uh, an improvement to the technical support on this. Um, we do know that one of the things that can be challenging over time is those gaps between reviews, coming back to a review, seeing what the comments were last time, seeing what our feedback was. Um, and we've all got, you know, we've all got busy lives and, and, and gaps between these. So anything which allows us to do this with a bit more continuity I think it's going to be very much appreciated at the moment. Um, so thank you very much for that, Lisa. We are going to move into breakout sessions. So we're going to take about sort of, sort of 50 or so minutes on this, including kind of sort of changeover between the two. I will reiterate um, before we start that we do have a series of videos going up there will be room to look for this information again that there is support at the other end of the email list here as well and that over time we hope to make sure there are more community opportunities for the different <clears throat> uh, the different reviewers to interact with each other because we know that that kind of community experience is really really important to this whole process so at this point there are no right or wrong uh, answers in the discussion about our interpretation. There are mu multiple people at different levels of experience in reviews. Uh, so it's really important that people just get to get to talk out the issues that they find as they as they work through this. I would urge you to do that. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to move into two separate breakouts. These will assign you to those as we as we jump in. Um, and everybody will have the chance to go into both of those breakouts, uh, which have been selected uh, based on the survey for um, 
based on what you chose during the survey process. Yeah. So we've, we've tried to aim for those. Um, we will follow this up by other questions, so there'll be room to do that. But what we're going to do is we're going to throw ourselves into these breakouts, uh, do 20 minutes broken up per requirement as best we can, just try and do some feedback and some back and forth on these after a brief introduction, and then come back and do a, a little bit of reporting. Um, I, don't, I don't know, how did, it go? how did it go for you, Olivier? Well, well, uh, it went well. Um, I mean, I would have expected more more open discussions. Um, maybe that the, the the profiles of the re reviewers in that uh, te technical uh, uh, breakout session was not so technical. So, uh, but it was interesting that uh, some reviewers said that they. Um, ask for assistance from their IT guys, for example, when when reviewing to uh, um, double check the, the responses, which um, which was um, was said uh, pre previous to the, the the breakout session during the first part of the of the um, of Visio, so which is perfectly fine. But yeah, I think that we had a we had a similar. Then come up with just you know can I ask around? This is this is one of the challenges here is because you're looking for a reviewer who who could be the person that was probably say the lead applicant when they uh, when they made their own application. Uh, so when you're the applicant, we say well go and speak to other people because you can't be expected to be the expert on everything. Um, mm -hmm. So it's something similar for when you were a reviewer. Um, over time, I think that working out what the core level needs to be um is there i mean i don't know how quite how you'd have a single uh a single auditor for instance or something like all iso 16363 come in and cover those in a, an additional level of detail i think the thing that came up was as long as the confidentiality of the applicant is maintained um then asking of those additional questions is fine um, but maybe one of the things for the for the board and for the review process is um, is working out the best way to collate the questions people are asking as we go along. Yeah, uh, what additional detail did you ask for? And that's one of the hardest things to do. We've got a three yearly review process, which is very open. Um, but but actually you always have those best ideas that you'd like to know more like while you're doing a review or while we're discussing something on the board and it's how we best manage to capture those kind of questions that, that we have live and seamlessly capture those questions that people have um without risking uh applicant confidentiality obviously um i mean i'm tempted to pull up a maybe just like an, a comment only version of the extended guidance so that so reviewers can start jumping in and at least say, you know, this is the kind of issue that I've experienced. Um, yeah, and I, I think a lot of our questions, Olivier, were that balance between areas where we can set an absolute uh, black and white pass or fail. Here's a really concrete set of rules that apply to everyone uh, versus that kind of difficult scenario <laughs> where where you know, there's such a huge variety of applicants um, that you have to you have to manage this. I mean, you know, I think we'd all be if we could close the core trust seal and make this should make this machine actionable and automated. I think we'd be more than happy to do that. But there seem to be too many humans who need to be involved so far. Monsieur Rouchon, would you like to give us a brief resume of your experiences? Bien sûr. All right, so um, we've, we've got two, two different uh, breakout sessions, but uh, each of them was very useful. Um, the, the, the main highlight for, from the first one is that kind of uh, mentoring process that they put in place in the uh, National Library of Scotland, where um, they help each other to, to uh, ramp up or, or get up to speed on that review process. So that was quite interesting. Um, and in the second one, we had some interesting discussions about the confidentiality of the evidences, the fact that sometimes 
uh, you can provide them um, separately from the two by, by email. They are not made public, but they help the, the reviewers uh, to uh, validate that, that uh, security requirement. The problem is that when it's about uh, recertification, the new reviewers don't know that some uh, confidential document have been provided during the initial uh, uh, application, the initial certification. So the 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 the, the, the comment is to uh, make it explicit in the the, com the the reviewers feedback that some uh, confidential documents have been received and analyzed as part of the uh, process. Uh, so that when it's about recertification, people may know that um, not all the documents are available, but some have been uh, analyzed previously. Was that clear enough? Crystal clear. Thank you. Okay, cool. Yeah, we had a, a similar question, which was around, um, you know, what kind of documentation is acceptable? Do you know what I mean? Is this just on our website? Does it need to be a policy? How much has it been approved? Um, and we've all got, I mean, you know, I'm a, you know, I want my, I want my stuff in a, in a nice PDF file that's got kind of like a version history and lots of, lots of official looking things written on it in terms of policy approval. But like, um, there are a huge variety of approaches. And I think that, that, that kind of, that theme of like not assuming that your repository, uh, is a perfect exemplar of how everyone else does something is one of the really big challenges as you start to work through these reviews. Um, you know, what's appropriate in certain circumstances. Um, I think one of the difficult things we've got as well is the fact that not everyone's in the same, you know, we've got the people who've turned up today as opposed to who've turned up this afternoon. Everyone will have different experiences with different requirements as well. Um, yeah, and I'm hoping that the governance question is there, but in terms of a very practical thing that we can do is yes, I think if anonymous evidence is provided, that should be very clearly in either the evidence statement or in the reviewer comments and should be retained for the future as well. Um, the other thing that we've discussed previously is the fact that by the time somebody comes back to a, a recertify, we really would like them to have come up with a way of sharing the evidence without it needing to be confidential. You know, there's nothing about the core trust seal that says we need to know the names of your servers or the details of your penetration testing. Um, so it should per be perfectly possible to prepare some external documentation uh, by three years later that, that supports your claims without being a security risk. But we know that obviously it takes effort and time to make stuff public. That's always a bit difficult. So uh, I'm going to briefly go over the two things that we covered, which were legal and ethical. Um, uh, we discussed the overlap with rights and the fact that um, the rights in R2 is more about the uh, mechanical implementation of the uh, artifacts around uh, rights management, whereas uh, legal and ethical is more about demonstrating that you understand the the, the overall context that you're working within. Uh, one of them is the fact that, uh, I'm it right, um, uh, Marianne asked about the must, could, and should. These uh, aren't perfect uh, in every case, but generally a should is there because there is a variation uh, with the way things are applied across repositories. Um, the sensitivity of data for legal and ethical, if they're sensitive data, we expect more. Again, it's a very gray area, but we would just expect the applicant to make more information available, be very clear that they look after sensitive data and for the overall evidence to reflect that they're aware of that. That's not the same thing as us doing an information security audit on their processes. You know, where do you sit at the core level? Um, so one of our uh, respondents was not familiar with cases where you had to deal with personal data like medical research. We sort of highlighted the fact that, you know, I might be more familiar with personal data, but there's huge numbers of um, other sensitivity data types, whether it's cultural or environmental that we all need to look at. So again, it's about transparency from the applicant about where the challenges are, and then looking to make sure that they take the measures and processes 
uh, that meet the needs of their designated community. It's not about being an information security expert. Um, open, openness and transparency across the board. Um, the other thing that came up was the fact that, yes, this is easier for larger repositories, maybe with a dedicated digital rights officer or another role there, which raised the fact that like, even though we expect more for more sensitive data, we need to balance the fact out that we need to be consistent in our responses to repositories of different sizes. Um, many smaller repositories will also need to be doing their best to get core trust seal and have got good practices. We cannot expect a national repository level of evidence from them. Um, so a little bit more case by case. In terms of the preservation planning, um, yeah, I mean, I think people were sort of probably more broadly comfortable with it in terms of our group anyway. Um, but uh, we do have a case where we need to look at the extended guidance to clarify whether or not that we're talking about the level of responsibility for each item or who makes the decisions about preservation. So that's something that we can clarify maybe in a future version of extended guidance. Um, we had a response about the fact that, not, that there's being someone who's not had a lot of experience of a documented preservation plan, that's where the question came up about, you know, is a web page enough? How approved does this need to be? <clears throat> but maybe we do need to look again. I mean, I would say that if you haven't got a preservation plan this time, we'd always expect a preservation plan by next time. Uh, and maybe that needs to be something that made that's made more explicit. You can check the extended guidance again for that, but I think it, it should be. Um, So, yeah, and asking about the level of approval of that preservation plan and how binding it is over time. Um, again, someone brought up the 500 to 800 word rule. We need to we need to build that into our thinking as well. There's only so much that can go into a into a core level application. Um, and then, uh, thanks to Graham, we had a, an exciting side conversation about the challenges of emulation in a, in a legal framework as well. Um, so, uh, and about the fact that fair use within the US makes that an easier solution than format migration. But I think that's probably something slightly outside this discussion. Uh, did anyone else want to pipe up and say anything they felt needed mentioned in the group responses now? Yes, um, Lars here. Hi, Lars. Congratulations. I, I want to to slightly disagree with the uh, propose, proposal that security documents should be online. So we had a discussion about different attack vectors, for example, how ransomware could uh, impact our security. Mm -hmm. And if I would put, put the detail that I offer for the reviewers online, um, someone who do, does then an engineered attack could uh, seriously harm our system. For example, if you know exactly what are the cycles of the backup uh, streams, then you could uh, target your de delay before you in start encrypting stuff. And then also your backups would be affected. So we don't want to have that information online with our uh, backup cycles and also not the systems that we use. Also, also if you know you use uh, this and that uh, system in this version, then you would know about maybe vulnerabilities. And so this is all information we don't want uh, online. Yes, and I I completely understand that, and I but I think that there is there should be nothing. It, it should be possible to develop a, a generic enough statement about your security approach that it can be made public without that additional level of risk. Uh, I certainly would because I'm not sure that my my security team would let me even send it to a reviewer, to be honest. So I think that we appreciate yeah, yeah. We, we appreciate that concern. Yeah. We appreciate that concern, um, and that is why we've got the confidentiality in place to allow people to do that. But I think that in the end, to get the core trust seal, there should be, and this is something we can reach a consensus on over time, we should be able to reach a point where we say, this is enough, and that line should be a line that uh, a security person within my organization doesn't mind crossing. Yeah, yeah. So what level of vagueness will tell the 
outside world that you're doing a good job, but won't tell the outside world how to stop you doing a good job. Okay, got it. Um, but yes, but for the moment, yes, you can keep on sending that stuff through. Okay, okay. so Olivia, right. I don't know if you had something short to say from your group. Yeah, uh, um, very quickly, um, the, the main issue raised during the session was about the um, technical expertise uh, required for the reviewers for, for those three requirements. Um, uh, so we, we tried to discuss uh, about that and uh, um, it's clear that you don't need to be uh, a, 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 an expert on security to assess uh, those those uh, uh, requirements. Um, we reinforce the fact that the, the, the process is based on trust. So as long as there are uh, evidences, um, that, that's uh, acceptable. It's the lack of evidence that 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 hurts really. Um, and um, yeah, if I want to be quick, that, that that's that's pretty much it. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just maybe bring up two things that were talked about in our group. So one is with the legal and ethical. Um, sometimes it's happened, I guess, in the past, or there's examples whereby the legal and ethical expectations or norms are actually in conflict in some situations. So, um, and so maybe it's good if we, as a board, look more into the head and, and see what just what we would put in the extended guidance if that is a known uh, issue. And then um, with the preservation plan, um, we did we do need to really clarify: Are we expecting it as a to meet this requirement one single document that is the preservation plan, or is it okay um, and totally fine that sometimes it might be distributed across multiple documents? Um, and just knowing, like, since it is a required element to have a preservation plan, what exactly are we looking to see, um, and what level of detail and any kind of nuances? That was something that people are struggling with. So that's something we should emphasize better in our extended guidance. Well, there's just one question I see here about the tool. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, it has been tested on small screens, but it's not very good. Sorry. Uh, the question is, I had a question about the tool. Is it tested on small screens? Uh, it has been tested on small screens, but um, it will put everything underneath each other. So I would recommend if you're doing a review that you do it on a laptop. So you have full spectrum of all the information that you need uh, at your fingertips. If you do it on a small screen, again, it is possible, but it's not something we would recommend. Okay. Or two, um, can graphics be included in line? No, no, no graphics are possible, only text. If you do have graphics, it would be great if you put them somewhere online or if they're on your website or something like that, and then you can refer to them through a link. Okay. Um, and it is possible to add, sorry, it is possible to add uh, one document to your application, which could be a zip file, of course. Okay, so thank you for everyone for their, their various questions. Well, this is all really useful. Uh, if you want to say anything rude about me or the approach or how this was done or how it might be done better in future, then write directly to Lisa. Lisa will immediately tell me, uh, but will anonymize the details so I don't know who was nasty about me. But this is all about making this better in future, yeah, um, for each other. So this is all a team. We're all reviewers as well. So uh, any feedback really is gratefully accepted. Um, a quick reminder as well, that because you have volunteered uh, to join the Assembly of Reviewers, that also means that you are a candidate for joining the board of the Core Trust Seal. Um, there will be a formal uh, request coming out in the new year for new board members, for people to sort of represent at that level. But if you'd like to start thinking about that now, uh, it would be really great to have some additional viewpoints on board so that you can do a better job than me next time this whole training thing comes around. Um, but yes, have a think and there will be something more formal in the new year. And first, I mean, finally, thank you uh, for your training participation, contributing feedback during the review process, and of course, for all your reviews. This is a self-started uh, like double peer review process completely built from the ground up from the community of people that are running it 
to a sustainable system. It is a fairly uniquely successful thing, which is more than the sum of its parts, but we are those parts. Thank you very much, everyone. It does make an absolutely huge difference and has had a huge impact on this community since it's been going. So we are very, very grateful for everyone's efforts. We really are. And it's, I think it's 9.30 and everyone gets their lives back and whatever, for whatever time of day they happen to be at. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes, thank you all for participating. Much, much appreciated.